Good evening. <clears throat> good evening. And good evening again. This is Wednesday night Bible study with fellow citizens of the household of God. We're in the book of Micah, chapter 4. So if you would take these next few moments to grab pen, paper, Bibles, and get ready for a powerful word from the Lord. Micah chapter 4. Before we begin, we will go into a word of prayer. I want you to focus your prayer on yourself, that God would open your ears and your understanding, that he would clear your mind, that your heart would receive what God is saying, that your mind would be receptive to it, and you would obey the word of the Lord for your life. I want you to focus on self to know that God is speaking clearly to his people. So I want you to focus on your ears so you can hear God. Clear everything else out of your mind. Get ready to hear what thus saith the Lord on tonight. If you would join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into the word for tonight. Here we go. Father, we thank you and we bless you. God, we ask you for forgiveness of all sin, sins of the mind, the body, and the spirit. God, clean us. Make us ready for your use. Lord Jesus, present us faultless before the Father that he may find use for us. Father God, speak clearly. Speak directly to those who would hear. Open their ears and their understanding that they may hear a word from you on tonight. Get in line with your word, God. Obey it and then walk according to what you've assigned for our lives. That we may bask in the manifold blessings that you've provided for these, your people. God, we love you. We appreciate you. We invite you into the Bible study on tonight. God, we invite you into each and every home that would be viewing. We invite you into each and every life that would be viewing. God, we ask you to come in, sit on the seat of our hearts, help us to become better representations of your presence here in the earth. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, anoint the ears of the hearers that they may hear what the Spirit is saying unto them as a church. Then God, anoint my mouth that I may speak only what you've said in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Those who agree say amen. God bless all for joining on tonight. Now listen, tonight Bible study is Micah chapter four. And it is powerful again because even in the midst of this being written back then, it is still applicable to us right now. It speaks of the condition of the church. It speaks of the condition of the people of God. It speaks of our condition in our current state right now. The first thing we're going to look at is verse one. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow unto it. Understand this opening statement God gave is just absolutely beautiful. The truth shall come and be seen by all. God is not going to always sit in behind the scenes for you to make the decision to make him number one in, in your life. He's he not going to always remain behind the scene. There will come a time, there is a time now for the churches of God. Any church that presents themselves as a representation of God, it is time for them to get on the, if you will allow me to use this uh, euphemism, uh, get on the good foot and begin to speak the truth of God instead of what the people want to hear what the people are accustomed to, what doesn't offend folk, what, no, God is looking for a people who will stand up in this time against all odds, against losing, 
your $4,000 a month salary against losing driving your Rolls Royces and having your plane against stand up against all of that and just speak the word of the Lord. Speak the truth. Speak what thus saith the Lord and what God is giving to his people now for us to be able to make it in, for us to be able to even have greater now. See, I'm not trying to sell you on the pie in the sky. I'm telling you from what the word says, we can have a hundredfold right now, but we've got to be in the truth. We can't be in this fairy tale Christendom where folk is always, well, God is love and God is going to make a way. God, Some of the things that we're experiencing as the people of God is because of what we've done, not because God is not moving. So for anybody to come to the place or to the realization to say, oh, well, it's God's will. Listen, God already expressed to us what his will was. He said, I would that none would perish, but all would have everlasting life. That's his will. He says, I know my thoughts towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of war with an expected end. That, that's his will. He said, I would that you would prosper even as your soul prosper. That, that's his will. See, so all of the things of his will are contingent upon our participation in the agreement with his will. So the first statement, the truth shall come and be seen of all. Then verse two deals with people will seek to learn the way of God to live walk and abide in his prepared place for believers. Verse two, and many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and he will walk and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, the word of the Lord is coming to express <laughs> total participation, obedience, commitment will yield such a bounty from God. It is immeasurable. He is saying that the nations will come. And, and, and I want you to pay attention in verse 2, how it speaks of the God of Jacob. Notice it had to go back to reference God in his time of, you, you remember what was going on with Jacob? Jacob wrestled with his brother Esau, blah, 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 blah. And from the lineage of Jacob came, you know, our Savior. Da, da, da. So when he talks about the God of Jacob, I want you to understand they are referring to the fact that when the people of God were obedient to God. Go back and read. He, he, did, he, didn't, he didn't give reference to the people of that time to their God. No, he said the God of Jacob. What, what God are you talking about? The one you was obedient to? The time when the people of God did what God said and accepted God as their king, accepted God as their leadership, accepted God as their counselor. That's that God. That, that, that's what you need to get back to. To where you've accepted God as your all. And you leave nothing to guess. You leave nothing to a preacher. You leave nothing to things of past. You focus, you trust and you depend on God. I apologize for that, but my hand was hurting. Uh, I know folk, some folk don't like to hear knuckles cracking. I apologize. Um, let's look at verse five. Ooh, good question. When God did this, I was like, wow. All right, let me read it for you so you can get a full comprehension and understanding. It says, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. God gave a question. He says, 
Who name will you be found in? Whose name will you be found under? Will it be your organization's name? You know, some folk are proud boasters of what organization they belong to. I'm Catholic. I'm Muslim. I'm an Israelite. I'm Koji. They wear these little pins and these identifiers that that as soon as you see it, you know that they belong to that organization. So is that the name you're going to be found under? Does that name save? Mm. Your pastor's name. That's the first name you like coming out your mouth when somebody, what church do you, my pastor is such and such. No, they ask you what church you go to. They didn't ask you who the pastor was. They asked you what church you go to. Now, when they ask you who your pastor is, you're more than welcome to tell them, but will, will you be found under your contribution name? Oh, I gave $2.5 million to the church and I, uh, like, God. or will you be found under the name of the Lord God? Jehovah. El Yom. Elohim. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Sig Canoe. What name will you be found under? The Lord Jesus Christ, his son. What, what name will you be found under? I know you think the name is going to be Christian. Mm -mm. That's a descriptive word. Only one name is given by which men must be saved. One name. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. One name. That's it. So this Christian thing was a way for us to to make ourselves something in God. <laughs> what name will you be found under? Let's look at verse six through eight. God will restore his people. Those for the truth's sake were stopped those halted in certain groups, those who were cast out or dismissed or mocked, those who were hurt by others, God shall restore. Verse six, in that day, said the Lord, will I assemble her that halted and I will gather her that is driven out and her that I have afflicted. there is going to be a reclaiming of God's people. There must be a submission. Please understand that there must be a submission. Then there can be a reclaiming. There must be a re repenting. There must be a coming to God. Let's look at verse 9. This question is very relevant today. God said, why do we complain to be like the world? Why do we complain to be accepted by the world? Why do we fuss? Why do we chide with God, fight with God? to be seen as a part of the world, but still want to be revered as better than the world because we have a relationship with God. What Make up your mind. To be friends with the world is to be enmity with God. The, the, the word says that. So I don't know why Christians have this, this hunger and this thirst. It, in the word, it says, if you he that do hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. He, it didn't say he that who do hunger and thirst after the world. It don't, it don't say it, but we hunger and thirst after the world and we want the world to accept us and we want the world to come and make us their friend. We want to make sure that when people walk into God's house, not the world's house, but God's house, that they feel accepted, that they feel loved, that they don't feel any condemnation. Listen, I'm not saying that you ought to put on any type of 
show to make someone feel condemned about coming in the house of the Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the fact that if they come into the house of God and they feel condemned to get saved, that's different. And it's not because you walk up to them and tell them to put a towel over your lap. Or you tell them, well, you can't wear pants. It's not about that. It's about the love they feel coming in the door. It's about the realness of God to you that they see. And they want that in their lives because everything else that they've experienced was fake. That's what it's about. The truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if those three things are not being projected when people walk into God's house, of course, either they're going to stay there for the camaraderie and the friendship, which a lot of people do. Church is nothing but a big country club. Or they're going to leave and go find somewhere else more comfortable. Now, if they do stay there seeking the truth of God, they're looking for a relationship not a return on their investment. Now, is there a return on our investment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Going into God, going into, yes, there's a return on your investment a hundredfold. Absolutely. But you should not go to the house of God for a return. You should go to the house of God for a relationship. You should go to the house of God to get to know God better, to know how to be pleasing in his sight. How not to be a stench in his nostril. Some of y'all so stanky, air fresheners can't fix you. Why do we complain and want to be like the world? Verse 9, let me read it for you. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. What does that mean, Lord? Well, I want you to go, everybody is old enough to understand what happens to a woman when she goes into childbirth. And she goes through what's called travail, which is just going through birthing pains. And it's very hard. Well, here, the scripture is going to explain to us that we're going to have to go through birthing pains because we're going to have to be born again. We're going to have to be rebirthed. Things are going to have to be stripped. What happens when a baby comes out? He is stripped from the environment of which he is comfortable and exposed into a new one that he knows nothing about. And it's uncomfortable. It's unsettling. It's upsetting. They've come up with all of these new techniques trying to make sure that the baby is wrapped really tight and held really close so that he can, so, so he can feel the example of what he felt in the womb. God says, you're going to have to go. Is there not a king? Is there not? A, in other words, God says now, when God went back and he compared the God of Jacob, during that time, God was their king. He was their counselor. Now you've rejected all leadership from God because the world didn't follow God, but you wanted to follow the world. Some of y'all need to get that, write that down, put it on the t-shirt because it's good. You wanted the leadership of the world, not of God. So you went after the world. You left God. The pe Go back and read. Children of Israel, give us a king. We want to be like the other nations. Why? You have God as your king. What you need to be like other nations for? If you call yourself a Christian and a believer, why do you want to be like your next door neighbor who's not? Because they drive a Mercedes? You feel like that's a, an accomplishment? That's a status something to be proud of? Really? <laughs> what does it profit your neighbor to have everything they want, gain the whole world, yet lose their soul, die and go to hell forever? This is temporary. They got about a good, if God give them that much time, 80 years. 70, 80 years. Uh -huh. 
and then they out of here. How long is forever? Nobody can give me a number because there's no number been assigned to it. Only God knows. And forever is in his power to say, all right, forever's over. Huh? Yeah. He said, do they not have a king? Well, is God not king? Go to Revelations 19, 16. Revelations 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is king. He said, um, is there no counseling? Meaning, was I not a good counselor? Please go to Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6. Please write these down and go back and revisit. Read for yourself, please. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, comma, huh, the Mighty God, comma, the Everlasting Father, comma, the Prince of Peace. God qualified to be all, was all, still is all. But you have to give him all in order to receive all positions. Yes, God is a good counselor. He's a great counselor. He's wonderful. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I know counselors right now who stop being counselors because they got tired of people's problems. I know people who call themselves preachers, said they used to be preachers. They quit, though. They couldn't do it no more. It wasn't lucrative enough. If you went into preaching for Luke, then you went in for the wrong reason. Bible calls that filthy lucre. You went in for the wrong reason. Can it be lucrative? Absol absolutely. To serve God and be uh, dependent upon God, you will never want. Absolutely. And I've never wanted. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. And I don't consider myself to be righteous. I consider the Christ in me to be righteous. Some of y'all need to get that together in your head. Because we're so damning to ourselves. Because we know the wrong we've done. We know the thoughts in our head. But it ain't about you. It's the Christ that's in you. That makes up the difference. You go back and look throughout scripture. You find where one of the apostles was dealing with something. Told God, God, I asked you three times to remove this something. God said, but my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to remove it. I'm, I'm going to let it stay there. It keeps you humble. It keeps you on your knees. It keeps you praying to me to keep you focused in line with my will for your life. If there is sin present, that means you have to ask me for forgiveness. And asking me for forgiveness causes conversation. And conversation causes relationship. And relation, y'all better get it. Am I saying must there be sin present? That's not what I'm saying. Please don't get it twisted. We do not want to put Christ back on the cross afresh every day. No, that's not the point. The point is you might have a hiccup in an area and that area could be acceptable unto God. Only God can classify whether or not he will accept something as sin or as a shortcoming. If he will accept it as iniquity or as an accident, or as whatever the case, a thorn in your side, whatever the case may be. Only God can, can tell us what each thing, and he hasn't done that. He looks for relationship with us, 
fellowship, a walk with him. But we oftentimes go to church, not for fellowship with God, but with fellowship with other people. We want to be around, as the old folk would say, I want to be around the saints. Well, I understand people who like to be around the saints, but personally myself, I want to be around God. I want to be where he at. I want to think what he wants me to think. Say what he wants me to say. Is he not a counselor? Is he not the king? We are having to go through pains of birthing, pains, coming forth, pains, introduction introduction into a new environment because we've left the environment of God and went into the environment of world. And of course, anytime you're ripped out of the world, it's going to hurt. It's going to feel like you're being rebirthed. It's going to feel like you've been torn away from everything that you love. And God says, y'all gonna have to go through these pains because, hey, y'all not making right decisions. Y'all not doing right now. In order to get your deliverance, you got to go through something. We want the blessing without the going through. And you go through something for the appreciation of what you've gone through and how you've been delivered. There are oftentimes so many opportunities for people to give a testimony for God. And they miss that opportunity because they don't know how to appreciate what God has brought them through. If it is not something great and grandiose, it's got to be grandiose. It's got to be huge. God delivered me from cancer. Well, he woke you up yesterday. I understand that can become your crutch. Thank the Lord for being here. Thank the Lord for life, health, strength. Thank the Lord for going down according. Y'all remember that. Some of y'all saints, y'all remember how people used to testify. And they would wrap this stuff off because it would just be. But then they'd get into a testimony time and they'd have to slow down. Because you have to hear what God is doing right now. Yes, I was diagnosed with cancer five years ago, but God healed me. Listen, what did he do for you today? Well, today I was walking and I felt my muscles give away. And anybody understand anything like that, on, on, especially on men, you, you, you can feel helpless. And a man of my stature, my size, to feel helpless to feel like I can't get my footing is a very strange place to be. But when you call on God and he immediately answers. No weapon formed against me shall proper, not e prosper, not even the weapons of my own flesh shall prosper against me. We've gotten to the place now when, when we tell testimonies, testimonies have to be historical. Not factual and not in time right now. They, they got to be from history. No, you, you testify today. What God did for you yesterday. What God did this week. How God opened up a door. How you asked God to do something and he did it. Because people need to hear right now testimonies. Because some of them may not ever go through cancer. Some of them may not ever go through diabetes. Some of them may not ever go through heart trouble. Some of them may. But they do have day-to-day -day issues that they feel there is no help for. It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. So some of your opportunities of testimony come when you're walking in the store. Your day-to-day -day dealings is an opportunity to tell the goodness of God. Now you see the truth in your world relationship as they who you called family and friends they read your demise, not helping, not comforting, but saying that you deserve it for trying to be like them, trying to be their equal. They will drop you like a bad habit and distance themselves from you even as you try so hard to remain relevant in their circle or even accepted among them. Verse 11, that is where that's coming from. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. They're going to they drop you. 
we play so so hard we 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 dance so hard to the music of the world and the world know we don't belong there see that's the funny part they smile in your face but they know you don't belong there that would be me going into a clan rally i don't belong there and they know it and they going to smile till they get tired of me Then when I begin to go through and I begin to experience some of the, they're going to turn and act like they don't see a thing. They'll uphold the wrong that is being done to me and not lift a hand to help because they were not true to me from the beginning. I was faking the funk. I was trying to be one of them, trying to be accepted of them. We have to live in the world, but we do not have to be a part of the world. Stop letting the world influence you each and every day. But then you expect God to deliver you out of the things that you get yourself into. Stop letting the world drag you into its conditions and its traditions. When you have godly traditions that you could, you could very well walk in, you could make your own. The, look, look, the book is open. You and your family make a tradition. Why do you have to follow behind the traditions or, or the things of the world? Why can't you make your own? God, we dedicate this time to you because I know this time last year, God, you delivered my family out of COVID. So God, I give to you and dedicate this moment to praising you. I dedicate this day as a celebratory day of God's victory in our life. Why can't we do that? The government has to sanction it. There is no mixture between church and state. So no job can make you work on a day that you've declared and your family has declared it is dedicated unto God. See, the reason why we get in trouble when it comes to us saying, well, we want to dedicate something to God is because we're not committed to it. We're not faithful. We play around with it. We'll tell the job, hey, I don't work on, on the Sabbath. I go to church on the Sabbath. But then, listen. But then when they want to offer you some overtime on the Saturday, all of a sudden you're available to work. Uh, uh. What happened? I thought you was faithful to God. I thought, mm. I don't work on Wednesday nights. I have Bible study on Wednesday night. I can't work. Well, we got this shift coming open and, and well, I'll do it this one time. No, once you break it, it's done. Once you break it, it's done. They got you from now on. Why? Because they know you're not as committed as you telling them. Your commitment in your heart is not as deep as your mouth. See, your mouth talk a lot deeper than your heart. Your heart is very shallow, very surface driven. Your bills start mounting up and you think God is not able to provide. So you need to help God. So you need to work that little extra overtime. Let me, let me leave people alone because folk going to get mad at me. And I don't want nobody to get mad at me. It's all right. If God is pleased with me, I'm good with you getting mad at me. God bless you. Listen, verse 13, and I'm going to leave everybody alone. Arise and thrash, O daughter of Zion. For I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now, I've got something else written. But let me just jump on that right quick because when I read it, the Lord said, listen, people got to understand that God controls the revenue of the world. And he just told you that he will control the substance of the whole world. He will consecrate the gain of the whole world. That means my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's in glory. What does that mean? Does it mean it doesn't come to? No, no, no. Please understand. When God takes control of the revenue, of the finances of the world, he says the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. He's going to turn things around and allow his people to now sit in the seat of decision. 
sit in the seat of prosperity, but we must be committed to our walk with him. We must be committed to our obedience to him. We must be committed with the change of life. You go through the pains of birth. You become reborn as a Christian. I need you to any man be in Christ. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things. I need you to take on the new man now. I don't need you to come to, to, to church Saturday, get saved, accept, accept the Lord Jesus as your savior, and then come Monday morning, you back to being the same person you was Friday. How does that happen? There should be some type of change. Somebody said, well, Bishop, it takes time. It sure does. But I should be able to see. You remember the old folk used to walk up on you and, baby, I see a light. I see, I see a brightness about you. Why? Because you would have a countenance of all of the weights of your life being lifted. The cares of the world are just shucked off of you and you're able to walk and bask in the, see it's going all over my plate. Y'all don't understand what happens when you get saved. That's how people know you get saved because you don't come back depressed. You don't come back downtrodden. You don't come back worried about that new overtime because you're going to church. You're going to serve God. You're going to get, that's how they know a difference is there because they see the light of Christ in you. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we shall see him, we should be like him. So let Christ be seen in you so that you can be more like him. Because I hate to tell folk, the only thing that is a, an acceptable key in the kingdom of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he is not seen in you, I don't care what organization you belong to, what church you go to, who your pastor is. If Christ is not seen in you, you are not accepted. That is not the right key. I'm sorry. It do not open the lock. You do not pass gold. You do not collect $200. Matter of fact, what he'll say is, depart from me, thy work of iniquity. I know you're not. What does that mean, Lord? Go to hell. Ooh, Bishop said go to hell. Yes, I did. Uh -huh. Keep living in sin. Keep allowing your life to be lived out according to the world's standards. And you'll find yourself in a very, very uncomfortable place forever. Preachers don't preach that anymore. They want people to think that hell doesn't exist. I, I, I don't know why people think that. Because if you're going to say hell doesn't exist, you're going to say that the devil isn't real. You can play with him if you want to. You can say he not real, that means he already got you. Because you're living under a cloud of confusion. You're living under a cloud of denial. He, he already got you. You swimming around in his lake. What lake, Bishop? The lake of denial. You playing with fire. And you're already burned. Get some sense about you. Start working your relationship with God. Let God build you. Let God take you into a place of safety and peace. Because when God gives you his peace, there's nothing like it in the world. You sleep like a baby each and every day. No matter what the world is going through, no matter what hurricane, what, what a tornado is passing by, what it doesn't matter. I sleep like a baby. I'm trying to date and the house stay together. And folk around me are safe because I'm here. What you saying, Bishop? Are you saying you some kind of, no, I'm not. But the Christ is in me, is in my home. And in any close proximity to where God is, there's peace. Any close proximity to where God is, there's safety. Any close, y'all better get that. When Jesus was in the ship asleep, he was asleep. Because you know, if you ever slept through a storm, that's some good rest. Ooh, that's some good rest. You sleep sound. And I mean that thunder be popping. Boom, shake the whole house and you just sleep. Jesus will sleep on the ship. Through the whole thing, got up, started talking to him, basically rebuking him. What y'all scared of? I'm here, and you telling me I'm going to drown? Boy, move. Peace be still. You heard what I said. Done deal. Good sleep. What am I to do with y'all, with this faithless nation? This nation of Christians who can't believe beyond 
a small little storm. Y'all, God bless you. Thank you. I could, you know we could go on and on. God bless you. I thank you for joining us tonight. We will be going over Micah chapter 5 next week. I look forward to the word of the Lord for what he has to say. I do appreciate all who have joined tonight. God bless you. Thank you all. I pray your strength in God. If you have any questions, please get in contact with me. I'll be happy to answer anything. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you Saturday at 1130 for Saturday morning worship service. Saturday morning service. God bless you. Thank you and good night.